Following the sound of rushing water, the wanderers found themselves at a convergence of streams. Here, underneath the city, sat four large waterfalls pouring into the aqueducts and tunnels beneath Barnacle Bay. The smell of fresh salt air hung in the great chamber, where the water forming these falls must have been piped in from the sea. The chamber was likely used by the pirates that used to frequent Barnacle Bay in the days of prohibition. It was possibly even a security measure, a way to flood the tunnels in case they ever needed to destroy the evidence. The wanderers wouldn't find easy access to the city here, but a ladder leading up to the surface seemed like the next best hope. Our heroes would follow this path to a large locked gate where they would need to locate three keys shrouded in darkness to gain entrance in to Barnacle Bay. <clears throat> All right, so welcome back to the Dungeon Dive, everyone. We are here today with Wanderer, the Cult of Barnacle Bay. So this is going to be kind of a, it's this is going to be kind of a, a review slash playthrough. Um, I would like to play up through the first boss encounter for you guys. Um, I really like this game, and whenever I'm not playing it, I often think about it. I think it does a lot of things right. It is not a perfect game. It does have some issues mainly in some of the, I would guess, some of the ambiguities or vagaries found in the rule book. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. I think, I think one of the issues with the rule book, and I'm finding this with more and more lately, um, there seems to be a desire to make rule books as concise as possible. And on paper, I agree with that idea. One of the reasons why is because things are expensive to make in board games and color rule books cost money and every extra page you know adds a few cents to every copy and as you're making more and more copies of the game that adds up that cost adds up pretty quickly. Another thing is I think the desire I think there's this there is this desire to present games in such a way that they seem less complex than they are. There's kind of this desire for simplification, for streamlined rules. And I think that some companies are pushing for that even though their games aren't necessarily simple and streamlined. And so, it ends up being there ends up being just some ambiguities in the rules of a lot of these kinds of games that probably could be solved with a little bit more robust rulebook with maybe some more examples and whatnot. So I think this I think it's actually I think it's a combination of a couple things. Um, I right now I am currently designing a dungeon crawl game. And I mentioned this to uh, Jerry Hawthorne, the designer of, uh, you know, Mice and Mystics, Coma Not Stuff Fables, um, that I, I've, I've never thought that designing a game was easy. I've always known that it is quite challenging, but I never knew quite how challenging it was until I like seriously started making my own. And so there are just so, there are so many things that go into making a game that it, it it is kind of making me think about games differently. But this is Wanderer, the Cult of Barnacle Bay from um, Panda Cult Games. And I've done an unboxing and look through of this game or, or look at. And um, I, I wanted to come back to it and do a playthrough. So this playthrough, um, because there are so many rules, ambiguities, that the questions have been answered. There, there's quite a large um, FAQ and, your, and errata sheet from BGG. There's probably going to be a lot of mistakes made. So again, don't never use my videos to learn how to play the game. But I would just like to present the game, kind of walk through some scenarios, 
and then talk about the things that I really like in this game. So one of the first things I like is the story and the setting. Um, the story so far up to this point. So this is the second scenario. We're skipping past the introduction scenario. But the story so far is we have this, we have this town of Barnacle Bay. And it is situated here on the coast. And this town is a quaint little fishing village with a long history. And recently, there's this new like religion that has moved in to Barnacle Bay. And this religion, this cult, is run by this chap here, Elder Bane. And more and more, he has more and more sermons, and his sermons are like... They're super engrossing. And every time he has one, more and more of the town folk from Barnacle Bay go to his church. And slowly they start to become corrupted by, it's kind of like, it's almost like a Cthulhu-esque cult. Imagine like they're kind of worshiping these deep ones. And so the critters of Barnacle Bay are becoming, uh, they're coming gro becoming grotesque and mutated. So like, you know, the uh, otters or the rabbits are turning into these kind of like uh, octopus creatures. The bears that were the guards of the village are becoming these massive bear sharks. The otters are becoming these kind of like lobstrosity type guys here. Um, and they're becoming more and more corrupted by Elder Bane and his worship of like the deep old ones. And one of the main bosses at the end, if you have the Kickstarter, is I think his name is Panda Thulu. So kind of a Cthulhu panda. Um, and I, 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 the game feels like it has a rich backstory, and I really like that. And one of the other things I really enjoy is the campaign book. So this game has a branching narrative campaign. Now, all of the games start with this um, intro scenario where the Wanders, it's a guild of heroes that has been called by... A few of the surviving townsfolk and they are called and they are hired to investigate Elder Bane and his cult. So they arrive and every time you play the scenario you will start with this welcome to Barnacle Bay scenario and at the end of it you get to pick um, three scenarios to follow up. So I picked this one. If you believe that the wanderers moved towards the sound of rushing water, proceed to scenario 1C. So now we're doing scenario 1C and then at the end of scenario 1C we will have three more choices. So you can play through this scenario a few times and see completely different um, stories, completely different scenarios and objectives on your way to fighting uh, I think it's three boss encounters. So there's a lot of variety and there seems to be a lot of variety in the objectives as well, even though they all share some of the same elements that you'll see on the map here. Um, it, it is a more story focused and choice focused campaign than I see in quite a few of these games and I greatly enjoy that. Now one of the things I, I'm often asked about this game is uh, what makes it different than Zombie Side or you know uh, is it better than Zombie Side and it, it's it's a little weird to me that this game is compared to Zombie Side by so many people and because really it's it's not really anything like Zombie Side. The, the, the only I, I think the only real similarity was made by people who used to work at Simon, uh, I think, or Come On, as they want to be called now, which I just can't get over that. But 
um, is so it uses you know basically these large tiles and large squares rather than little individual um, squares for movement and positioning and to tell you the truth that's really the the only similarity to zombie side because zombie side is all about it's all about massive crowd control and every scenario is basically the same it's not so much story based there are no um, non-combat encounters very little exploration so even though you're using these large areas to move this game doesn't have a lot in common with zombie side I'm sure they're both have dice based combat but this has a really good balance and hopefully you'll see that in in, in, in the gameplay but it has a really good balance of dice chucking you know uh, kind of a mirror trash style encounters and combat with some more like puzzle like elements in trying to solve the encounter in an efficient manner because because of the tight movement and there's a real economy of actions and there are it, positioning is super important and the way that the enemies activate you do kind of have to think and you want to think about how you're going to be um, positioned and the the order in which you're going to engage the enemies is important so I think it does strike a really good balance between being just a kind of a, a no-brainer dice chucker fun game with a more cerebral kind of uh, tactical game not, not that it's anything you know close to like a, a mage knight or or anything like that or even like legends, legends of andor but it does scratch both itches in a way um and another way that it's completely unlike zombie side is the fact that there are non-combat encounters and that's one of the main reasons why i like this game because it has this giant deck here now some of them are duplicated of course but it has this huge deck of things that you can find when you search these darkness spaces and so there there are all kinds of things in here like there's treasure there are tests there are things that you can make with choice choices that you have to make and a deck like this would go such a long way for me to make the zombie side style games much more enjoyable on a moment to moment basis but okay so i am playing with two heroes and we are playing with uh, atrocities at random. We are playing with Tank, the Guardian. Um, at the beginning of each scenario, the only things that carry over are the treasure. And we are carrying over a helm that we found in the intro scenario. It's a level one treasure, we're still at level one. And your XP and your special abilities, they reset every scenario. And it kind of gives you a chance to rebuild your character. You know, the, the leveling up and the XP are kind of like the immediate benefits. And the treasure is kind of like the long-term way you upgrade your character in this game. So Tank the Guardian has five health. He has a natural defense of two and a natural knowledge of two. And then starting at level one, we can pick two different um, abilities. We can pick Vicious Counter. So you have a crit defense causes one wound to a close attacking enemy per crit rolled. Or we can choose Shell Slam. When you crit attack, it causes knockdown. So I am picking Vicious Counter. I do wish that the game came with ways to keep track of the ones you've chosen. That's one of the complaints I have about this game. But we will just remember that we are taking Vicious Counter as his level one ability. And then he has his starting hammer and his starting shield. And he has his wounds of five there. Okay, and then we are also playing with Ross the King. He's got four, two, and three, so he's a little bit more knowledgeable. 
He has one less health. And his level one abilities are Encourage. Heroes in the same space gain plus one defense reroll, including Ross. Um, and or sturdy counter a critical defense roll causes knockdown and we are playing with encourage to get that re-roll on the defensive so we kind of have two very defensive characters um, we did find some a ranged weapon for him which is throwing axes which is really nice because we didn't have I didn't have any ranged combat with these guys and that's going to come in, in, in handy because I am using the enemies from the high tide expansion and these boomers are really nasty because they are like these uh like rat critters that are in these kind of poisonous almost like grenade type barrels and when they die they explode and they cause poison to all close uh heroes and a close means that it's like the target so if, if, if um ross here was the target any hero here, 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 or here would be poison. So it's a big area of effect. So we need to try to take those guys out from range and not be, uh, and hopefully so we don't get poisoned. So this is the first um, encounter for this. So the objective here is we start here. And the objective is to find the three keys in the three objective darkness tiles. And those are going to be in part two of the encounter. So each of the encounters in this game are broken up. And most of the time it's between a, a, a below ground setting and an above ground setting. That's another thing I really like. Um, I feel like the tile work in this is very reminiscent to Mice and Mystics. They must have been um, inspired by that because Mice, Mice and Mystics does a lot of that flipping tiles to go, you know, below something or under something. So in this first part, this grayed out is the second part. So we're only dealing with these tiles. Then we have to clear out the enemies, go to, and then we can activate this ladder. And that ladder will have us flip this tile and then we will come above ground. So we're underground right now. Here are the four waterfalls that uh, it was talking about. One is covered up by this darkness token uh, card, and we don't know what's underneath there. It could be, uh, I believe it could be a spawn, a, um, a treasure, or a event card that we have to draw. So we need to get above ground and find the three keys, and then we have to defeat all the enemies and reach the end token. And that's gonna be in part two of this encounter. Um, special rules I've already followed. We were supposed to remove the objective darkness because those are going to be placed above ground when we get there. Um, let's see. And a hero holding an objective token. So we have to find the keys and those are going to be represented by objective tokens. May be an action to use it to unlock the gate which represents the objective wall. So we have to find the keys and then open the gate to progress through the story and we're going to keep track of where we're going so we started off at the intro and then we went to scenario 1c and then i think we'll have a choice when we when we come to it of which boss to face at level one and if there's interest we will we'll kind of like maybe take a quick vote in the comments to see which boss we want to face. Now, one of the other things I really enjoy about this game is the advanced initiative track. And I would love to see more dungeon crawls use something like this because it, it adds a very simple but meaningful way to have positioning mean something. So these were, um, Randomly, I, I shuffled all the cards and it just happened to come out like this where the two heroes are in positions one and two and then we have the monster, uh, each group, archers, boomers, brutes, and grunts. But depending on where they're at, they get a bonus. So if you're at one of these shield locations, you get a plus one to your defense rolls. If you're at one of these axe locations, you get a plus one to any of your attack rolls. And then this is one of those weird rule things, the movement. The movement gives the heroes an entire move action, 
whereas it gives the enemies one extra space of movement. So that is a rule that is often overlooked. But anyways, so the main way you play is you just work your way through the initiative track, taking actions. As the heroes start out, they have two, accent, two actions each. And right now, none of the enemies are what they call engaged. And I feel like engaged might be a little bit misleading. I wish it was called active or something because engaged sounds like you would be engaged with one hero. Basically what that means is as soon as a hero moves into line of sight of an enemy, that enemy group is considered to be engaged or considered to be active. And what that means is, is for the rest of the scenario or the rest of this encounter, that group is able to activate even if they lose sight of a hero. An enemy line of sight is drawn diagonally or straight ahead. All other attacks are only orthogonal. So let's uh, play a turn here. So we have Ross coming up first. So if we move here, we are, in, we are automatically going to activate the uh, brute here. Because if we draw a line from the back of the square to here, well, maybe not, maybe not, maybe uh, it may not pass through. Let's see, we draw from here to there. Oh, actually, we can move there because it's from the back corner to the opposite back corner, and it still passes through that red wall. These red walls here, they block line of sight. So we can move here and not draw the brute's aggro. These blue squares represent water, and they're very hard for the heroes to move through. So Ross has two actions, and one of the actions is a movement action. And a movement action gives you two points of movement. So he can move one, and then he can move two into this water. Now water, when you move into it, it immediately ends your movement. So that would be his second movement here. All right, let me give you a close up here of, I love the minis in this game. Um, I would love to have a fully painted set, maybe someday when I'm old. <laughs> Famous last words, as I always say. Okay, so for Ross's second attack, or for second action, uh, I'm gonna make an attack. So to make an attack, we look at his, uh, his cards. He's got a, um, he's throwing axes. Throwing axes, any ranged weapon, can be made towards an enemy in which there's a clear shot, which just means it's an unobstructed view. So from here to here, nothing's blocking the view. So I can chuck one of my throwing axes at one of these uh, archers. And so we have three dice here. And what we're looking for is we are looking for the range symbol or the crit symbol. And then the crit counts as one success and it also explodes into um, another dice, another die roll. Now one thing we have to do here now is that since we moved into line of sight of the archers, their enemy group is now active. So I'm gonna remove this, uh, I just use these uh, gray dice here to represent active or inactive. So we're gonna move that off to, to show that the archers are now active. So that group is going to be moving now. All right, so he's gonna attack one of these uh, one of these archers. So we're looking for ranged or crits. And there is one ranged. So if you look at the archers here, they have two health, they have zero defense. So one of these archers takes one point of damage. And we'll put that like that. So that was both of his attacks, or both of his actions. Next up, we have a tank here. And I think Tank's gonna do the same thing. We're gonna move here, then we're gonna move here. And then for his second action, he's going to attack. So close, he can attack in the square or an adjacent square. Again, not diagonal though. So he's going to attack, uh, he'll attack this damaged 
and then I don't have any specials for attacking just counters so all right so here we go so we're looking for hammers or crits oh there we go that was just an awesome roll so we have one success to three successes both of these count as re-rolls there's four successes and a re-roll uh, four successes all right so that completely destroys this too bad i didn't have cleave or something that could pass damage on but this archer is now dead and that gives tank one experience now with xp this is another way that it's kind of like zombie side as you move down as you move up in xp then the spawns become more and more uh, dangerous so right now we're at level one spawns as soon as we hit four xp we will move into level two spawns if we ever have to spawn something again all right so that was tank next we're up to the archers so we will activate this archer first so it doesn't move because it's already in range then we have this archer over here so this is where sometimes things get a little thrown off because you think well this archer doesn't actually have line of sight but it is in the archer group so it does get to activate all it's going to do is move enemies these spaces count as blocked spaces except for until a hero explores them so all of that archer is going to do is move so you move all the enemies in that group and then you perform all of their attacks so this archer here is does one he, he automatically hits for one and now we have to we have to block that any hit that isn't blocked becomes a wound so because both of these are in range we go by initiative order and ross is up first so ross is going to take the hit ross has a two innate defense plus he has his shield which gives him a three plus he's number one in the initiative so he has four dice to roll to defend against that attack and he also has a reroll because of his ability so i only need to block once we're looking for a shield or a crit i got my shield i got my crit and there we go i blocked one so it's all good okay so none none of the other enemies are activated yet because these boomers here they can't see past this wall these guys can't see past this wall there are no other archers this uh, brute can't see the heroes so right now we're relatively safe because all we have to do is deal with this archer so that's kind of that's pretty much a full turn um, and I think that's where we're going to end it it was a little long-winded at the beginning I just kind of wanted to talk about this uh, some of the things that I wanted to get out in a review for this game as I play the game because I like doing that I like when I'm when I'm playing a game I'm kind of constantly always thinking about things I like and don't like so this might be kind of an interesting more interesting way to do a kind of a long form review is to do it while we're playing while we're engaged in the game and experiencing it together so all right guys well I hope you enjoyed this video and we will talk to you soon bye bye